why do we do disability inclusion coaching? Why is that something that's so important to me? And it's because how we think about things does have such a big impact on how we show up in the world and how we treat other people. And I really do believe that bias is a barrier to belonging. And by tackling the bias that we hold, we allow space and room for belonging for ourselves and for other people to truly happen. Welcome to Chez Jeunesse, the place of new beginnings. My name is Katherine Hubert, and I founded and own a French-inspired cafe where, as a team, we are on a mission to change the way that our world understands neurodiversity and employs humans with disabilities. Our restaurant was born and is based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's where we practice and teach our mission and model. This is our channel where we dive in deep to who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Our hope is that this content is empowering to disabled and non-disabled humans alike, and that no matter no matter what perspective you are coming from, employer, employee, parent, friend, or Shazeness fan, you feel welcomed, you learn something new, and you walk away with a deeper appreciation and understanding of humanity. Today, we are talking about is neurodiversity a superpower? This is coming out of not really a question that I hear a lot of times when we do workshops or when I talk to people, but more so statements that people make in workshops that I do. And so we're gonna talk about it. It also came out of, we did a video, I don't know, a couple months ago about giving credit where credit is due and highlighting disabled innovators, business leaders, creatives, etc., in our world. And something that I found a lot when I was doing that research was articles and journalists, authors, etc., citing disabled humans, citing like their skill set and the things that they contributed to the world as their superpower. So that kind of spurred this idea of, you know, let's talk about this. This is actually something that is thought of and that someone prevalent in society and is or can be a disability bias and it's something that I hear in our workshops. So that being said, Sage and S teammates, your keyword this week is cappuccino. As I was preparing for this session, my initial thought was like, okay, we're going to talk about how disability and, and neurodiversity is not a superpower. And then as I started to think it through, I was like, I think there are actually multiple ways to look at this, which is the beauty of neurodiversity. And one of the things that I love most about having a neurodiverse team is that there are a lot of different ways to look at something and to understand something and to accomplish something. And something that I value a lot about my team is that I get to see that play out on a daily basis. And it really challenges my own ideas and understanding and opens my eyes to a lot of possibilities that I never would have seen or understood. So kind of going back, is disability a superpower? Is neurodiversity a superpower? We're going to talk about that from two different perspectives. This is only two, right? I've just acknowledged that there are many different ways to see something, which means that there are probably more than two ways to see this. We're going to talk about two of them for the sake of time and for the clarity of this video. But if you have other things that you wanna add, please put those in the comments below. Would love to see that. This is just a friendly reminder to please subscribe to our channel. Thanks for being here. Thanks for helping our content grow. And thanks for engaging and participating in what we do. So we are going to talk about one way that I think neurodiversity and disability is a superpower, and then one way that I think that that gets misused or misapplied in society. Starting off with the affirmative, neurodiversity is a superpower in terms of having a neurodiverse team and recognizing and celebrating neurodiversity. That is a superpower for any organization, business, environment, family, friend circle, etc. There is so much benefit, there's so much depth. There's so much insight to be gained when not only having groups of people with neurodiversity present, encouraged, it's seen, it's celebrated, it's acted on. That I think is such a superpower. It sets a setting and environment apart, not because it doesn't exist in many settings or environments, but because it's oftentimes not recognized, understood, or valued. And I think that those are key components of taking the power that is within diversity and truly using that to 
add to the environment, allowing space for each human and each person to come into a group, to come into an environment, to come to the table, however you want to describe that, with their full selves, to express their ideas and opinions, to have room for individual emotions and feelings, to listen to and and respect and understand someone else's perspective and experience in life, to grow in our appreciation of humanity and all that that encompasses. I think that adds so much to the vibrancy, to the richness, to the depth, and to the innovation and growth and change that we can see in our world. And that can start in small groups, that can be in big groups. But that, that aspect of seeing and celebrating neurodiversity, I think is such a superpower for any family, friend group, organization, business circle, etc. And is something that can and should be prioritized more in our world. And then switching gears and talking about a way that I think using disability or neurodiversity as a superpower can be harmful, or if not always harmful, then at least misapplied, is claiming that every person with a disability or who identifies as being neurodiverse is limited in one area of life but more than makes up for it with their superpower. I think that is misguided and it can be really dismissive or diminishing of someone's experience. It also is a little bit polarizing to classify disability in such stark terms. And it, it digs into, I think, a bias still that parts of disability are bad and parts are good. I think the goal there is trying to move away from the idea that disability is inherently flawed or bad. And so it's saying it's not all bad. Some of it might be, but there's this really big positive that you have this superpower or that you're exceptionally gifted in another area. Instead of just seeing that all part of who a person is, disability included, is truly that. It's just part of who they are as a person. And that person's experience with themselves and who they are is going to be varied and may change over time. It may change day to day. There may be things that I like about myself today that I learned to like more or that I learned to grow in. Like there's things that I may not like about myself that I learned to accept or to grow in. Like humans are not static. We're so dynamic. Things are ever shifting and changing. So I don't think it's helpful in any context to really label specific parts of us as being bad and some being good, which is not always, I'm saying that knowing that that's not always the intent of someone saying that someone has a superpower with neurodiversity or whether it's with a disability. But I think that it still can be part of that conversation or be woven into that narrative. Some examples of that might be oftentimes I hear people say things like talking to another person with a disability. It's like, you have autism? What's the thing that you're really good at? Is it puzzles? Are you really good at math? Are you gifted at music? Like there's this assumption, again, even if there's this, it's a bend towards the positive, like there's an assumption that you are really good at something. It's still a stereotype that's being played into. I know that I haven't appreciated that in times in my life when people jump to a conclusion about a piece <laughs> a piece of me, right? Like I know from my education, I was homeschooled through high school and I remember, still remember, I mean, this is a long time ago, this is more than half my lifetime ago, that someone met me and found out that I was homeschooled. This was an adult and his response was, oh, you're supposed to be really smart. Say something smart and just stood there and waited for me to say something intelligent. what the hell is wrong with you? You know, I'm like, I didn't say that because I was homeschooled and I wasn't allowed to say things like that. But there was this feeling of like, why are you putting me on this spot? Like this, this isn't, it's not an abnormal experience for me. It's part of just what I do. Like I could be smart, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stand here and be your puppet and show off for you to appease your own idea or stereotype of who I am as a person. And I think that that happens around disability sometimes. It's like, perform for me, show me, tell me what you do. You're either confirming or debunking a bias or a myth. And that is not the job of the disabled person to do that for a not disabled person. So that's one of the issues that I have with that. Another thing that I'll hear oftentimes is when we're doing workshops and people have 
a family member or a friend with a disability and they talk about them, it's done a lot of times with the goal of, I think, finding relatability, but sometimes it can look like, oh, my nephew has Down syndrome, but he's the most genuine kind person you'll ever meet. Or, or give an example, oh yeah, my, my friend growing up, was autistic, super smart, very like we'll kind of go into an explanation of how that disability is positive, which again, even though it's steering towards the positive, it's done with the assumption of you're thinking negatively about this person. So I already need to prove you wrong and list off all of their positive qualities, which inadvertently is still playing into that bias that there's something wrong with disability instead of just stating something for the way that it is. So an example there could be just saying, one, you don't even have to say, my nephew has Down syndrome, but he's the kindest, most genuine person that I know. You could just say, my nephew is super cool. He's really kind and genuine and just leave it at that because that is who he is. You don't know that Down syndrome is the contributing factor to him being kind and genuine. It might just be because he's kind and genuine as a person and also has Down syndrome. But if that is gonna be a distinction, then simple, simple structural changes in that sentence could look like going from my nephew has Down syndrome, but he's the most kind or genuine person that you'll ever meet. That but implies, again, Down syndrome, but don't worry, here's the superpower, here's the positive, and instead just saying my nephew has Down syndrome, he's the kindest, most genuine person you'll ever meet. Like that can just be a statement. It doesn't have to be that there's anything wrong or negative about Down syndrome. It's just both of those things are true about him. He has Down syndrome, he's kind and genuine, that's it. Simple rewordings makes a difference still in the tone and what is being communicated and also how we think about something. And again, that, that kind of goes back to, it's like, why do we do disability inclusion coaching? Why is that something that's so important to me? And it's because how we think about things does have such a big impact on how we show up in the world and how we treat other people. And I really do believe that bias is a barrier to belonging. And by tackling the bias that we hold, we allow space and room for belonging for ourselves and for other people to truly happen. So that's it for today. Thanks for being here. Thoughts, comments, questions, all the things, drop them below. We will see you next week.